we welcome you to this year's first uh, uh, Elliot Coffee Talk. And you might ask, who is Elliot? Does anybody know who Dr. Elliot was? All right, Do <laughs> not surprised. Dr. Elliot was our first librarian here at, at Southwestern Seminary. And so our Coffee Talk is named after him. Uh, to memorialize what he's done for Southwestern. And he is the, one of the founders of the American Theological Library Association. And so those are the guys that you will be happy to use that index. And if it wasn't for them, all of that religious knowledge would not be as accessible if it wasn't for his wonderful forethought there. Well, today we are happy to have Brother Mark or Dr. Jansen as our speaker, and some of you already know some things about him, but let's just bring us up to speed. He has his bachelor's degree from Central Bible College in Springfield, Missouri, which I'm well aware of, having come from Missouri, so woohoo to Springfield and that background. He has his master's from Trinity Evangelical and his PhD from the University of Memphis with his uh, dissertation on the iconography of humiliation. So that sounds like something worth <laughs> hearing about later as <laughs> another point. He's done field work in Luxor, right? Yeah. Luxor and in the North Sinai. So you've got real life experience there. I understand you have an article or a chapter coming out soon, Ma'at. Ma yeah. And uh, it's a study of reforms by Akhenaten. So I, from looking at his CV, he's got a lot of uh, knowledge on Akhenaten, and, uh, he, which I think is quite admirable. So today we're welcoming our brother Mark, Dr. Jansen, who is going to talk to us about walking like an Egyptologist. So we'll be welcoming him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Kubik, for extending the invitation. I, uh, I went with the Indiana Jones joke for good reason. Um, at least a couple of you in here can relate to this because I know you do enough archaeology. But inevitably, when I tell people like neighbors and, and people like that that I do Egyptology and archaeology, you, I've probably heard 50 times in my life, oh, so like Indiana Jones. And I usually say, well, well, I can see why you'd think I have a lot in common with, you know, Harrison Ford, the debonair good looks and so forth. <laughs> he is a terrible archaeologist, right? Those of you that do archaeology could probably answer this question for me, but he destroys pretty much every context. He loots all the monuments, right? It's like an exact not how to, how to not do archaeology. And then they find out I'm an Egyptologist and they'll ask a series of other questions, usually related to, uh, to what they know about Egypt. And uh, they'll say, oh, so you work on the pyramids? And I'll say, well, no, not really. I, I mean, I take students there on occasion, but I don't really work with them. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, what about mummies? And I'm like, well, no, pretty much the same answer. You know, I, I take students to see them in the museums, but there's really not that much going on there unless you're an Egyptian with a permit to work on the DNA. And at this point, they kind of start giving me blank stares, and I'm like, okay, they think I'm kind of lame at this point. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you the monument I work on is actually really awesome. And... First and foremost, what I do is epigraphy. So we're going to do a few things today. One, I'm going to introduce you to the big picture of the monument, which is Karnak Temple in Luxor, Egypt, ancient Thebes. Then we're going to do a little really quick overview of what epigraphy is and a brief how-to. It gets really technical, and I don't want to spend too much time on the technical stuff, but just to give you an idea of what we do. And then we'll spend the bulk of our time on the actual project on the wall that the Tandy Institute has the permit to work on. This is Karnak Temple. And right here, you have a it's forest of columns called the Hypostyle Hall. And that is the project that we are consortium partners with, with Dr. Peter Brand and Jean Revez, who are with the Universities of Memphis. Peter Brand was my main advisor for my dissertation. And Jean Revez is with the University of Quebec at Montreal. So they've graciously invited us to be consortium partners. So we're all working on it together. And then my specific wall, or our specific wall, is right here, the western part of it, the western exterior wall of what we call the Cour de la Cachet, which means the court where they found a whole bunch of statues in French. <laughs> so this is Karnak Temple. This whole huge thing is Karnak Temple. And Karnak Temple is the largest temple in the ancient world. It is also the longest 
used or the, had the, the longest period of use of any religious monument in the ancient world and probably ever, in all honesty. So it's venerated for over a thousand years. The Hypostyle Hall is the grandest of such halls. Temples typically had one. And it is also the most richly decorated. What you can't really tell from this slide is that basically every square foot of the walls, the columns, the ceiling, you name it, is decorated with monumental scenes or rituals or texts. The pharaohs in question start with Seti I down to Ramses the Great and their successors, hundreds and hundreds of religious scenes they commissioned. One way I like to put it is it's literally acres of relief carved into the wall. It's an enormous undertaking to really record that. And all of this is basically a sample of the sacred activities that Pharaoh and the priests of the god Amun and Amun-Ra would enact. So it's, there's daily sacrifices, there's libations, there's scenes where they, God gives the king the crown or the diadems of the pharaonic office, and there's military scenes on the exterior walls. There's even scenes that show the god's statue in a little shrine leaving the temple to visit other temples, having a play date with the other gods in that part of the world. And this is the giant festival that the people celebrate. So we have a really an excellent snapshot of New Kingdom Egypt on this enormous, enormous temple. This is an early reconstruction of the Hypostyle Hall. The roof is very much damaged, of course, hardly survived. But if I go back to my, uh, my intro with the pyramids, if this monument was fully intact, and all the splendid colors, yellows, whites, golds, blues, etc., were all still surviving, it would be every bit as breathtaking, or more so than the pyramids. I'm biased, but I think it's more impressive than the pyramids. Plus, more people get to use it than one guy in his tomb. Right? I mean, come on, what a waste. Not to diss the pyramids too much, but this is an incredibly breathtaking monument. And what I love about taking people here if I don't spoil it for them in a setting like this, is everybody knows a little something about the pyramids. Everybody understands that they're staggeringly enormous. But when they come here, they're like, wow, how did I never hear about this place? People are, tourists are really blown away by Karnak. Now, if we focus just on the Hypostyle Hall on the image, a few fun facts for you. This covers an area large enough that you could accommodate the whole of Paris's Notre Dame Cathedral inside just the Hypostyle Hall. And that's just a part of Karnak Temple. When I say it's the biggest religious building that was in use for that long, probably ever, it's, that's what I mean. It is enormous. <clears throat> the size and splendor of the Hypostyle Hall, I think, is enough to astound even the most jaded observer. A few other fun facts. The central nave here, the tallest columns, there are 12 of those. And they're 21 meters or 70 feet high. And again, there's, just imagine them building this in ancient times. Each of them, every single column is actually a papyrus plant. That's the image they're going for. In the central nave, those middle ones, they actually have the bud open up. Those buds are about 18 to 20 feet in diameter. And you could, if you really wanted to, if, the, if you took the blocks off that, that are left that were part of the roof, you could put about 100 men in total on them. Those columns support a system of architraves and huge windows with massive stone grills. I'll show you a, a sort of drawing of that in a second. And then flanking that were another 122 smaller columns, about 40 feet in height. And there, the papyrus bud is actually closed. So it's, it's actually really clear even in this reconstruction. The larger ones where it's open, the big circle at the top, and then here where it's closed. So even the columns themselves are rich with symbolism for the Egyptians as a heraldic device in and of itself. To the other artistic sketch for you, most Egyptian temples have a hypostyle hall. It's just not as grand as the great hypostyle hall. A hypostyle is just an ancient Greek term denoting a building having a row of columns supporting a roof. I mean, it's really a, it sounds technical, but it's really simple. This fits the idea that the Egyptians have that the temple is like a divine mansion. And so it's modeled after the home and then expanded greatly, of course. And so they're imposing structures of stone on a large scale that reflect the open courtyard. You could see that in the first image, actually. And then you move your way into the temple. It's loosely parallel to what happens with the Israelites, where the further in you get, the holier the temple is. And only Pharaoh and his priests can get to the holiest of places. Loosely parallels it. So 
What you have here are the stone grills that I mentioned before that let light in. A lot of this actually results in a design very similar to things that you might be more familiar with from Greece and Rome, or even medieval Gothic cathedrals, which will often have that central nave that's higher than the stone grills. Um, of course, they get really elaborate too. But I'm here to tell you the Egyptians are actually doing all this thousands of years before those groups. The scenes in question, we'll just give you a quick sample of them in the interest of time. On the exterior walls, you will typically have battle scenes. These are designed to both memorialize Pharaoh's victories. Sometimes they're purely fictitious. They're designed also to enforce ma'at, and so many of you guys are my students or former students, and you know all about ma'at, but that's the Egyptian concept of truth, justice, order, and the Egyptian way. And a good Pharaoh subdues foreigners to keep the cosmos in order. By this time period, what they've done is they're now giving us what's called a chariot battle narrative. And in a chariot battle narrative, we have a nice sequence of events, much more historical than rhetorical depictions. Pharaoh gets commissioned by the gods to go to battle. From then on, there's good history as he sets off with his army to the location. They sometimes camp out if they have room on the wall. Then they go to battle. That's almost always shown, pretty much every time. Sometimes you'll get a place, a little fort that they're attacking, or a people group. You'll have enemies in a state of chaos as they're hopeless and helpless. They never stood a chance, right? Pharaohs never memorialized defeat. Then they will round up the prisoners that they capture, march home, and present the prisoners to the gods. And so you get those types of scenes on the exterior walls of Egyptian temples all over the country, and Karnak is no exception. So they bring glory to the Pharaoh, but they have another purpose. And this will be new for you guys in my class. We didn't get into this. And that is atropropaic, which means they are magically protecting the temple. So the idea is Pharaoh has defeated this enemy. And now by memorializing it forever, essentially on the wall, I mean, just look where you can still see it, right? They're saying that they are protecting the temple from this group in case they were to ever attack Egypt. They believe that it would magically be protected by the very fact that they're reenacting Pharaoh's victories sort of in perpetuity. And we have scenes like Seti the First battles in Syria, Canaan, or Ramses in Syria, Canaan, and Lebanon. We have battles where they fight the Libyans just to the west of Egypt. And these are always going to depict Pharaoh and his chariot team as larger than life. The enemies are always in a state of turmoil. A lot of times they get ran over. A lot of this touches on my dissertation. This is, he, he, Dr. Kubik mentioned the iconography of humiliation. It's, it was really about how they treated prisoners of war and how they depicted them. But that's a topic for another day. Back to the scene types. This, this is just a quick look at the main columns. I hope those of you can, over here can see this well enough. But here you have a quick schema that the project has done showing you what was on the columns and where. As you can see, pretty much the whole thing is decorated except for up here, but this was actually a bando text. That to the Egyptians is its own decoration. It just doesn't look like much. You have a series of names, sometimes multiple kings. Usually Seti the first, Ramses the second, or Ramses the fourth. Then you have the scenes where you have, again, this would wrap all the way around the column, but where they're offering things to the gods. More names, more names, some more decoration and you, you go on and on and on. And they will usurp each other's monuments and sometimes take the previous pharaoh's name out and put their, their name in and do all sorts of things like that. But every, what I'm telling you is this wraps around these and every square foot is carved with some type of scene or text. And if you look really closely, especially those of you in the front, and I showed you guys this in class for those of you in my Western Civ, they even decorate up underneath. And these are actually some of the most fun because the color survives really well there because it's constantly in the shade. So that's an overview of Karnak. It is, by any rational measure, an incredibly impressive monument. So let's talk a little bit about epigraphy, and then we'll get to the western wall of the Court of La Cache that we work on with the Tandy Institute. Epigraphy is, at its most simple, a convergence of science, art, language, and history. This man is a... Uh, has a close personal connection to the project. He is, unfortunately, he passed away in a car wreck in the year 2000, but this is William Murnane, the founder of the project, and my mentor's mentor. So he's sort of in my academic family tree, if you will. And he's doing uh, the, the more old school style epigraphy. Strictly speaking, epigraphy is also the study of inscriptions and texts. In our case, monumental, right? This is all an ancient monument. 
But you could also do a epigraphy on pottery. You could do a epigraphy on anything with, with any kind of artistic or textual record. The goal is a precise recording, editing as necessary, translating if you have the text, and ultimately publication. What we want to produce is a scientifically, scientifically accurate depiction of what's on the wall in print. So then the real question is, how do you take what's on a huge wall that's badly damaged and put it in print in a form that's actually legible and easy to understand and still accurate? And that's really what epigraphy does. Oftentimes it involves preservation or salvage epigraphy. This monument's already been preserved as much as it'll basically be preserved, so we're not doing that. It's also extremely expensive. But in a sense, we are doing salvage epigraphy in that it could constantly be damaged more. Where we are is right out open to elements, the sun especially in Egypt. And so we want to do this before the, the monument takes any further damage. Thankfully, Egypt doesn't have any of the issues that we're seeing in Syria when it comes to the monuments. But you've seen it in the news in the last couple of years, a couple of temples in Syria being destroyed by, um, by ISIS. So that's another reason, though, that part of the world we need more people doing epigraphy because we could lose it forever at any point. Ours is more the slow attrition of sun and wind and so on. So how do we do epigraphy? And again, we're not going to get too complicated on this today. The main thing really is, is that technologi technologically speaking, we're always sort of reevaluating it now. For a long time, we've had in Egyptology what's called the Chicago House Method, named after the University of Chicago's epigraphic works in Egypt. They really set the standard for a good hundred years, and they make absolutely beautiful publications. And that method involved hiring artists and being on the, at the wall, nose to the wall, for months at a time. And we still do the nose to the wall, and we still hire artists as needed. But now they have even modified it, and they've put out a really wonderful PDF if anybody really wants to read about it. They've got videos, tutorials. It's marvelously well done. If you want it, I can share it with you. But modifying it because of our digital age, right? Why would you do it slower if you could do it just as accurately and faster? That lets you save or preserve more monuments. And so the modified method means that gone are things like squeezes and latex methods where you put a substance on the wall and then you pull it off and you have an accurate impression of what's on the wall. But of course, what's the problem there? It damages it. it damages it. Even if you don't visibly see damage, you can't help but take some little particle off. If you do this on the wrong crack and you're not well trained, you could take a whole chunk off. I mean, that's the biggest sin an epigrapher could commit. And so they've quickly abandoned that at the start of the field's history. And then we thought, oh, well, latex will be less destructive, but it still could damage the monument. And so pretty much no one endorses these methods anymore. Instead, we have an increased reliance on digital photography, digital mapping, and photogametry, where we take the photos with the high-definition camera lens, of course, with the, the, just the right amount of zoom. And photogametry is where you can use that. Then to do, You can run it through the software and use it to get all your measurements. It streamlines the whole process. It's really step one is the photos. But we still use old school things like the collation sheets. I've got an example on the board of one of those. In fact, simile drawings are still vital. What we do now, though, and what we've done, I'll explain in full a little bit later, but you take your photos, then you use software to make your drawings, basically a vector tracing of the photo. And then you have that, you print that out, and you can take notes on that and then edit it. Instead of having to redraw the whole thing, you just go back into the software to edit whatever you maybe got wrong. Here's an example of a finished collation sheet. So you have the original drawing, what they thought was on the wall in one particular season. Maybe they come back to it in two years or next year or whatever. And then you can see they take notes and little check marks saying, okay, yes, we definitely have the bull's horn accurate. And just giving you a generic example, but maybe we drew the eye a little bit too low and they'll make a note that the eye needs to be up higher. If they're particularly artistic, they may even go ahead and draw it. Um, but for those of us who aren't that artistic, the digital method helps a lot. Now, some of you may be asking the very obvious question that many a tourist has asked watching us work. Why not just take a photo? You know, you see us out there doing this exacting process of trying to make a perfectly faithful drawing or a detailed enough note that you can fix the drawing back in the lab with your computer. And why not just take a photo and leave it at that? I told you photographs had, had revolutionized it. But the problem is, well, phot photography is the most direct means, and it's absolutely vital. Nobody does epigraphy without high-def photos now. It does not, and it did really revolutionize the whole field, 
it does not end up giving us the most scientifically reliable method because every photo has severe limitations. The strong light and dark shadows, especially, created by the intense Egyptian sun, conspire to hide much information. Every photo is subject to lighting. If you don't have the lighting perfect, you're going to introduce a distortion or a shadow that could obscure a feature. No matter what, no matter how good you are at it, this is just the reality. But that is not to say we don't use photography. But in the bright afternoon sun, even the deepest carved relief can be washed out. Or the reverse is true, where a relief that raises out from the wall can cast shadows onto the next relief or one below it, and that obscures it. And so it's not as effective as actually taking the time to use the photography to then do a detailed line drawing where you then pretend you had perfect lighting and we have field conventions for all that that I won't get into. Not to mention that the reliefs are often severely damaged or eroded, or they actually will at times put a scene on top of an older scene. Plaster over the old one, put up a new one, plaster is gone and we get a mess like this. Even if you can see some of the details in the photo, I think you could all agree the drawing shows you the scene under the scene much better. And that happens with great frequency. And so the idea is to make it as clear as possible in the publication. Now, of course, we'll publish the photos too, but the drawings often give you details and subtle traces of, of carving that you couldn't get from the photo. And then, and I've done this too, you can do this very carefully. Um, sometimes you will find a trace of a hieroglyph that you can't even see with the naked eye and definitely wouldn't see with a photo that you could feel, very carefully feel that there's like a depression there, that there was a line. And so there's a lot of detective work to it. And this is an example, this is not ours. This is from the Chicago house uh, from 2009 of the final product with the old method merged with the new. And you can see that's badly damaged wall. These little blocks are, are parts where the relief is just missing and lost to us forever. Where their skin showed on the king or the god, their hands, sometimes their arms, almost inevitably their face. Those were hacked out by later people who were superstitious that they may come to life and harm them. <laughs> Iconoclasm, really. And, and you, you wouldn't necessarily see all that as clearly in a photo. And so we have field conventions to show that th those things. We always p pretend the light is at the top left. That way the shadows are consistent. You can see like this is a shadow right here. And so you, you always do that. You go back and you edit your drawing to show all that. We're, that's like the final stage. We're, we're not even close to doing that part yet. But if you knew hieroglyphs and if you know uh, what the scene is, this is very much crystal clear. And scholars can work with this much better than a photo. Another reason to do these painstaking drawings is some of the scenes are enormous. We're talking like 50 feet of a wall. If I had a good photo of the whole wall, I would have showed it. But this drawing, you can actually make out the fact that we have a sea battle, and Pharaoh obviously is clear. But in a photo, you think you could really make out all the details of all the individual enemies and the arrows. I mean, it's, it would be a mess in a photo, even the best photo. There's no way they wouldn't have shadows overlapping some of the individuals. And so the photos help us, and they have revolutionized the field, but we can't get away from the detailed drawings. All right, we'll go back to Karnak real quick, and now we start in on our project. Again, here's the hypostyle hall, and here's the wall that we'll be looking at. It might be easiest to actually just show you a top plan of the whole monument. Here's the forest of columns that I've showed you several times. Right where it says Hittite Treaty, this is our wall. Or we could go closer in to the hypostyle hall. The blue is a scene of Ramses II which we'll hopefully be working on after this current project. The yellow is our wall. And now we'll take a closer look at the wall itself. This is a, a totally useless photo for epigraphy because of the angle. You, you, once you have an angle, it's complete garbage for epigraphy because it changes the ratios and everything's off. I'm showing you this just to show you how it connects to the wall of the hypostyle hall. Right there, that corner, go back is where the yellow meets the blue here. So this is just to orient you, where you have these pilasters right here and here. In the middle of all that is the Hittite Treaty between Ramses II and the Hittites. That has been studied already by the French, and so that's not part of our concession, our permit. So that part we don't do. It's already been done. But of course, it's very important historically. Now, during the 2004 and 5 season, under the direction of Peter Brand, the project focused on the south wall 
of the hypostyle hall, the blue one from the last slide, of Ramses II, which th that wall then intersects with our wall, as you can see. And on our wall are a series of battle reliefs of a similar, similar character to the ones on the south, south wall of the hypostyle hall. For decades, Egyptologists assumed that the scenes on both walls had the same author and were of the same series of reliefs, namely commissioned by Ramses II, a.k.a. Ramses the Great. Then, in the, late in the 1980s, the late Frank Yurko, another Egyptologist who actually passed tragically before his time that studied this monument, he presented a compelling case that the battle reliefs on our wall were, in fact, Merneptah's, the son and successor of Ramses. Naturally, a robust debate ensued, and we'll come back to authorship shortly. But for now, the main point that we want to correct, the biggest part of the whole project, the absolute number one goal by far, is the fact that scholars waging, weighing in on that debate did not have access to a scientific epigraphic publication of the scenes on this wall. Some of them would draw them sort of freehand quickly. There's a few older publications that aren't that accurate that they tried to reference, but they really can't have the conversation without something scientific to cite. And we will be producing that publication. In other words, we aim to correct that. So we'll turn to how we did it, the first steps now. This is the ortho photo, the master photo, one photo to rule them all. What we did is, this is the most important thing that we achieved in our first season, which was just last year, too. But what this is a replica of the wall using roughly 430 photos taken at eye level using scaffolding, like every little bit, and of course much slower than that. But this way, whatever distortion you enter into a photo, if maybe the camera shifted a little or you're getting tired and it kind of weighed down, because you have hundreds and hundreds of them, and then you run it through Agisoft, it's called, and that scans all the photos and takes out distortion because everything overlaps so much, it can tell when a photo's a little off, right? Because there's so much overlap. It takes it like 18 hours, I'm not kidding. We're like waking up and making sure it was still working and not freezing the computer, right? It's like a $4,000 computer that could even be able to do it. And these are all HD photos. The whole thing is over a gigabyte, just that photo file size. So this is a compressed version. And that then gives us an accurate depiction of the wall. From there, since it's so high def, we can also splice and zoom in. And then we use that to do our line drawings in Adobe Illustrator and some people do it in Photoshop, it, it's really irrelevant. Either one's fine. So again, this is a compressed version. Then we'll take those printouts of those line drawings into the field with us in small sections, highlighting certain features that we can then take notes on. It'll probably be about a 200-page booklet that I'll divide into four or five so each student can have their section for a couple days and then pass it on to the next person. So, but as you can see from the image, ours is not a particularly pretty wall. Note especially the four or five gigantic rectangular shapes cut out in antiquity by people to either use it as a roof of sorts, like to almost live in the wall, so the wall's really wide, or to put their horses there and so on. And so this has actually been damaged long before we ever got a chance to work on it. But that's, that really just highlights how important the work is too. That it's so badly damaged in so many different ways and there's the weathering and things that fade and so on. But overall, what we have is Pharaoh attacking three fortified settlements with a fourth scene on the top badly broken to where he's attacking somebody, but we're not sure 100% who. Then on the far south end over here, we have a series of captives bound and arranged in rows, heavily faded by the sun. But this would be when he's heading back to present them to the gods. So what we're going to do is a, a snapshot of a few of the more, I think, interesting features or the clearest ones. So we're going to highlight this scene right here, and now we'll zoom in on it, where Pharaoh attacks Ashkelon. And we don't have it drawn all the way yet for the glyphs. We'll have that before we leave. But here's the hieroglyphs, and right here is the word for Ashkelon. This is the only place name on the wall that has survived. We're like, that's exactly where Pharaoh is attacking. It's too bad we don't have the others, but again, I guess that makes it more interesting for speculation, too. And you'll note uh, where the Hittite Treaty was, we're just to the right of it. In fact, in the image, you can just barely see the pilasters here. So we're just right of the famous Hittite Treaty. This is our best preserved scene. And the early drawing looks something like this. Again, the whole why not take a photo. 
a little easier to read in the drawing version. It's just the, the way the field works, and we've, you know, 100 years of practice, it's gotten pretty well uh, unanimous agreement on that. Now, this is the first crack at this. We aren't adding the field convention of sunlight and shadows, and it's not been prettied up yet at all, because we want to just do it as accurately as we can, to then go and collate it, we call it, where we're nose to the wall, looking at what we drew, saying, okay, that's wrong, and that's wrong, and that's right, check. You double check it, triple check it, quintuple check it. We'll check it as many seasons as we need to to be confident that we have it drawn properly. Come back after the season, use the notes, edit the drawing. That's why it's beautiful to do it digitally. All you got to do is change your vector points, change your angles, uh, use your pen tool. There's all kinds of ways to edit it that will streamline the process. But Pharaoh is off screen to the right in this image, and you can actually see just a little bit of his huge horse's legs. And there's a few features that I think are fun to point out that are already really crystal clear. The red arrow, you see an Egyptian soldier, and he's like attacking the gate of Ashkelon with an ax. Right? Of course, in all reality, would he have done this by himself while everyone else is fighting? Of course not, but it's their way of saying that they're attacking the gate. In the blue, we have an Egyptian climbing a ladder. This is a really good example of the process at work. Hopefully some of you in the front row can tell you. Can you tell we aren't sure if there's a line right here? You see how his head doesn't actually finish connecting? We need to examine that in person, for example. But I like how he climbs the ladder with his weapon and shield on his back. Like, you know, you actually should climb a ladder. Those of you in my class, next week I'm going to make fun of the Assyrians because their soldiers will have their spear out, their shield out, and they're like hovering over the ladder. Here it's pretty realistic at least, even if people are larger than life and so on, at least the ladder looks right. To his right, you have this strange enemy who's already been defeated with the headshot by Pharaoh. He's toppling. Note how large he is compared to the others. There's a chance that, they, um, that this signifies his social standing. Maybe he's an enemy leader. Could also be space filler. They do not like blank space. Where we have it in the drawing, it's just because it's the, where the blocks are cut out or it's the hieroglyphs that we're still working on. And then we have my favorite, the green arrow at the top. So you have all these guys, uh, enemies in the crenellations, in the fortification, and one is love it, like holding up a cup, a chalice, to Pharaoh. Others are like, no, Pharaoh, please stop. And there's these little lines coming out of it. They're definitely there. Old publication I've seen, I get a kick out of this. One, one guy, his name was Walter Rosinski. He published way back at the turn of the 19th century and into the 1920s. So we're talking like 100 years old, his publication. It definitely needs, it's definitely not accurate. But he colors in one little part of the wall. Nothing, that colors in, nothing else but this. He colors it in gold. I just love it. It's like he's saying that the, he thinks the defender is like offering the Holy Grail or something to Pharaoh. Like, I don't know why he would color it in yellow, but I'm like, was it actually still yellow 100 years ago? That's the only thing I could think of is for why he would. But this is, a, this is an attempt to appease Pharaoh and in the attack regardless. All right, now let's jump on to the other side of the Hittite Treaty. That's our best preserved one. This is where our detective work magnifies exponentially. Unfortunately, we no longer are able to tell you a precise place name. It's lost. And he, Pharaoh attacks two places, in the lower scene, one place, and in the top scene, one place. No place names for either. We'll take a closer look at this scene. This is the most important scene on the wall for all the historical puzzles that we are trying to solve. Here you can see Pharaoh storms a stronghold with his sword out. You can see it at the very top. Call it the Hepish sword. And if you take a look at the very bottom of the image, those of you that can see it, can you tell, especially on this side, do you guys see the wavy lines? That's from the Battle of Kadesh. That's the river. Right, we just showed you the whole thing with the river in the, the full scenes from Kadesh. But this doesn't fit this scene. This is what we call a palimpsest, a scene underneath the main scene. In other words, an older scene, which was then replaced by the pharaoh here. The south wall of the hypostyle hall, the one that I showed you in blue, also has palimpsests. And what we're pretty sure happened, and we're really close to having this confirmed, that's one of the things we'll be able to publish on fairly soon, is that the south end was, a, was started by Ramses II. And what he wanted to do was celebrate the Battle of Kadesh. So there, that's the blue again from that earlier image. And as these artisans are working on it, they realize they're going to run out of room. I'm going to try to do it from your perspective. 
So I think, okay, well, we'll just we'll keep Kadesh going. We'll round the corner onto what is what I call our wall, and they'll have more Kadesh there. Because Kadesh is this enormous scene wherever he actually manages to put it, which he celebrates 10 times. It's way more than any other single event is celebrated by a pharaoh in history. Well, then Ramses shows up to the temple one day. He's like, how's Kadesh coming, guys? Well, you know, we ran out of room, but I think we have a solution. We're going to round the corner, and then maybe Ram Ramses doesn't like that. I don't know, maybe he lops off their heads right then and there, but that is an ascetic compromise Ramses is unwilling to tolerate. You can't wrap it around the corner. That offends Egyptian sensibilities. A loose parallel would be somebody playing a C scale and stopping on the note B. And you're just like, oh, play the other note. Right? Ramses is like, no, we cannot wrap around the corner. This won't do. So he changes it, and on the south wall, he puts his wars in Asia, in Canaan, basically. Something he's not as quick to celebrate as Kadesh, but it'll do for the space he has. He never seems to do anything else that we can tell with our wall. Now, previous Egyptologists thought this was him, but we've got definitive proof that they were wrong. What I think he does is he plasters it over. So, okay, no one will see it. We'll just plaster over it, paint some lines on it, make it pretty. And then he celebrates the Hittite Treaty, which now stands out really well from an otherwise just white wall. He's got his treaty. Then he dies. His 13th son, Merneptah, succeeds him and is king of Egypt. Merneptah fights one campaign. Most of you should have heard me talk about this. I know if several of you know it. And that is against the Libyans and into Syria, Palestine, which he memorializes on the very famous Israel stela, the first extra biblical mention of the people of Israel in history. That's the only campaign on record we have of his, but we are certain that this wall is the same campaign. We'll come back to that point. So, but once he's done with the stela, or perhaps before, it doesn't really matter, he's trying to figure out where he can celebrate his own battle and his own might, like any good pharaoh. He wants to celebrate at Karnak, like any good New Kingdom pharaoh. But he's got a really healthy respect for his dad, so he doesn't want to steal dear old dad's monuments. Well, where does he have blank space to work with? to the western wall, to the north and south end of the stela, the peace treaty. He's not going to mess with the peace treaty. That's too important to his dad, and he's not going to usurp that. He's a good son. But he will put his battles on either side of it. That's where he celebrates, I believe, the same campaign associated with the Israel stela. Underneath it all, though, once you fast forward to modern times and everything's eroded more, we still get all these little traces of Ramsey's initial work on the Battle of Kadesh. All right, so now we're going to close in just right here, just above and to the left of Pharaoh, old remains of Ramses the Great's Battle of Kadesh, including all these figures that are basically horses. And I'm trying to show you it both drawing and photo form. The photo's obvious, they're horses, but I mean the drawing is. But the photo, so that's the horse's back, rump, legs, again the horse's back, Another horse is back. You keep going. We even have a few soldiers, very, very faint. And this is the detective work. This is the fun part. This is pretty much where I'll spend the, probably the entire season, this upcoming season when we leave at the end of November, because we need to sort this all out. Some of these have been drawn by previous scholars in their quick versions, but most of this has been unnoticed. And so we're going to, I think, do the field of great service by being able to bring out that he was a little closer to finishing Kadesh than we realized. And so that makes his change even more dramatic if you think about it. So these are still, of course, also still in progress. It'll take a couple years to really hash all this out. Now for the most important piece of data on the wall. This is right there by the king that I showed you with the sword. These are called cartouches, the name ring. Inside are the king's names. You see these little rings with the line at the bottom? You should think that's either the name of a king or a god. This cartouche is terribly damaged, obviously, and we're still working on this. This is the most important thing on the whole wall because we want to figure out who really wrote these scenes, authored these scenes, commissioned these scenes. Is it Ramses or is it Merneptah or is it someone else? And they sign it in, a, in the form of a cartouche. So we have the cartouches of clearly two pharaohs, Merneptah and his son and successor, Seti II, Merneptah's name shows evidence that it's been erased, hacked out, that they tried to steal it from him. They tried to erase his name. That was done almost certainly by a man named Amun Messi. I'll talk more about him 
in a minute. And then SETI later added his name. So as we return to the all-important topic of authorship, we go back to Frank Yerko. He proposed that these scenes were authored by someone other than Ramses II. That was controversial in and of itself. He also believed that on the broken top scene that I'll show you in a moment would have been the depiction of the Israelites. And now that set off a serious firestorm of controversy and, and academic debate. And it's a really interesting thought. I don't know that he's right or wrong. We'll talk more about it in a second. But again, the point is, now you're talking not just debating Egyptian history, but you're talking about debating biblical history and the origins of the Israelites. So this wall extends out even to biblical topics. And again, that highlights its overall importance. Here are the cartouches on the left of Merneptah and on the right of Seti. And the black and yellow would be like what it was in other monuments where it's perfectly preserved. For you guys, trying to keep it from being too technical, the red arrows trying to point out an element of their names that is unique to Merneptah. The blue is pointing out something unique to Seti, the reed leaf. So Merneptah's name doesn't have this blue arrow, the reed leaf, anywhere in it. To give you a sort of ridiculous analogy, but for fun, imagine Dr. Lofton, my good buddy. That's right, he has friends. Dr. <laughs> Lofton has signed an important document. Okay. Then at some point, some jerk comes along and erases his name from it. It's Dr. Lofton, so maybe he wrote it in pencil. You never know. But Lofton, but I, excuse me, but I caught the guy before he could forge his own signature and steal the document. But I don't want to go back and give it back to Keith, so I write my own name in. Now, what letter do Lofton and Jansen have in common? The N at the end. That wouldn't tell us much. But let's say faint traces, you fast forward thousands of years later, and they find this document. They're trying to figure out the history of this document, because really what we're doing is a document in its own right for the Egyptians. The J and the K would be very helpful. If you had both a J and a K, you'd know you had two different people's names. And think about it, even flip your notes over one page. Even if you erased it perfectly, you're still carving on that paper. The most minute little trace. And that's sort of what's happening here. With all of our technology, we're able to take a look at all the minute traces, even if they think they've, in their own day, Merneptah's name's here. It's hacked out. Then his son comes along and figures, well, I'll just put my name in there. I am the rightful pharaoh and his rightful heir. And no one in ancient times would have seen anything under it by the time they plaster it and paint it and do all the things with it. But you fast forward 3,000-ish years, and with our modern technology, and we're able to start to unwrap the layers of this very complicated historical puzzle. So what happened was pretty clear. And again, nobody messes with Ramses. His name is not, we don't find a trace of his name in those cartouches. That's the key point. If his name was there, we don't have a trace of it. For that matter, if they were trying to usurp his monuments, why don't they do the Hittite Treaty? They don't. His name is not messed with either way. So it's firmly established that the name of Merneptah has been altered. And some argued there was an even earlier name, Ramses, but we can't find a trace of it. And I think we would be able to. And again, his other names were left intact. So why would they attack just the one name, just the one scene? This is the damaged scene that I referenced earlier at the very top of the wall. You can even see the sky sort of in the back, just barely. Just above the Ashkelon scene that we talked about with the big drawing that we'd already mostly finished. Various scholars have put forth evidence as to who these people are, but Yurko thought they were maybe the Israelites. Now, there's a simple problem with his theory, and it's not that he's wrong per se, it's that it's so badly broken that all we basically have is a few torsos and the legs of the enemies. No hieroglyphs, no faces, no headgear or hairstyle, things that you would need to say this is the Israelites versus some other Canaanite. It's an intriguing suggestion, but we have to be careful because it, there's just not enough left of this wall to prove it. But I do think the wall, because Merneptah only had the one campaign, sinks up with the Israel Stila. So they would have been on here somewhere, and this is perhaps the only place left. But again, it's far from proven. Now, back to the authorship. We've done the cartouches. Let me give you the history of what happened here. On the left, we have a statue of a man named Amon Mess. On the right is Seti II. Now, Ramses produced as many as 50 royal sons. It's a lot of people interested in the throne when he dies. 
He's succeeded by his 13th son, Merneptah. But when Merneptah dies, he only reigns 13 or so years. When he dies, the, the dynasty fell into civil war, probably because a different one of Ramses' blood is vying for control with Merneptah's son. Amun Mes would say, I'm, I'm related to Ramses. I have just as strong a claim. Who cares about Merneptah? They're, they're all trying to use Ramses as the, the sort of justification for this. And so Seti II is challenged by this man, but Seti's the rightful king. Seti controls, at the start of his reign, only northern Egypt. Amun Mes actually successfully controls southern Egypt, where Karnak is, where our monument is. Amun Mes controls that for a couple years. But he doesn't have much time to do a whole lot of monumental architecture. And so what he seems to do is he tries to steal Merneptah's scene, and he hacks out Merneptah's name. But before he can actually carve his own in, Seti takes control of the southern part of Egypt, reunites Egypt, and now you've got this cartouche with the rightful king is on the throne, but there's this cartouche with no name because they hacked out Merneptah's name, and Seti says, well, I'll just put my name in there. Now you can debate whether a good son would restore his father's or whatever, but that's why we have Merneptah and Seti. So that's what we think happens to our monument. It's quite the conundrum, but there is no trace of Ramsey's name, and there is no trace of Amon Messi's name. One theory that makes a lot of sense that wouldn't be visible today is if Amon Messi carves it out and he's in a hurry, he's trying to get to all these scenes, right? He maybe knows his time is short. Maybe he just paints it over, some plasters it over and paints it. He never carves it, and then that's long gone because it's just a generic paint. Once you carve it, you have, you have the line underneath, and then you plaster and paint, but you still have the lines underneath. We also have Seti on a block from our courtyard that would have fallen off the top of the wall somewhere. There's some blocks in the, right there by the wall. This is the only one that we're convinced is part of our initial wall. And right here where I zoom in, it says, Iripat Seti, which means Crown Prince Seti. So even in Merneptah's reign, we have him depicted on the wall as the future king. They will do this frequently. It's a way of showing this is the one who's supposed to be my successor. But what do you notice about the glyphs in the photo? They've been attempted, they've attempted to erase these as well. Well, no one cares about an otherwise unfamous crown prince. His name just happened to be named Seti. But if it's Seti's second future pharaoh, who would have an agenda to erase this? Amon Messi. And so we can add that to the puzzle piece. And so it starts to be pretty clear that what's going on here. And it, this is not ever going to be definitive, but I think the probability is extremely likely now that, Merneptah, that Ramsey starts building the, or commissioning the reliefs to Kadesh, goes around the corner, doesn't like it, scraps the project, puts his lesser wars on the south wall, or from your perspective, the south wall, plaster on the west wall, our wall, Hittite treaty, more plaster. Hey, the Hittite treaty pops out real nice. Merneptah says, hey, I, I need to celebrate my wars, but I'm not taking dad's space. I'm not taking grandfather's space, but I've got this plaster no one did anything with. Maybe he doesn't even know Kadesh is under there. He may not have even been born by that time. And so he carves his own wall, his own scenes in there. He dies. You have this fight for the throne. The usurper tries to steal his monuments real quick. And then his son comes along, reunites the land, and puts his name in the cartouche instead of restoring dad's. Maybe that makes him a jerk, but I'm pretty sure that's what's happening. So, to wrap up, our ongoing goals. Number one is by far the most important, to conduct a scientific epigraphic analysis of the scenes and text for publication, which will then aid future discussion. We are going to make the publication that anyone that wants to use this wall to understand either the end of that dynasty, like just the history, or to understand and weigh in on the debate about the Israelites would need to cite it. We will be the clear pictures that everyone could use. So I think that really will help the field tremendously, and I'm not trying to brag by saying that, but it, I'm really excited that we get the chance to do that because the field really desperately needs that to be done. The second goal is to determine the original author of the scenes, data permitting, and again, I'm almost certain it's Merneptah. That's basically what the last half of my talk was about. Same thing with number three, to clarify the chronology and the issues of succession in the late 19th dynasty, all the stuff after Ramses II, which I think we're pretty close to having a very workable answer there. And I think the theory that we have is, is going to hold up when people have a chance to read it more. And then examine the blocks in the courtyard. There's dozens of them to see if there's any others that seem to have come from the wall that we could then 
photograph and do the whole spiel with, and then use the software to try to figure out where it would have fit. So that's the, uh, that's the, the pipe dream goal. If we could get that to work, that would be amazing. I don't know if there really are any. They could be from anywhere in the temple. Um, so that one's, that one's a, a little bit less likely. So we're really excited to have the, the opportunity and hope that this will be a great help to other scholars. And there's a host of people to thank, um, in addition to Dr. Kubik for the invite, Drs. Brand and Revez for inviting us to be a part of the consortium, the Egyptian officials for giving us the permit, various people here that helped raise funds, including Mrs. Patterson. I mean, there's so many people that are involved in this that don't actually end up actually at the wall really ever. So I thank all of them as well and you for your time. So we got time for some questions. Okay, Q and I, we've got the microphone, so we want to hear your question. Who wants to start off? Not everybody all at once. Yeah. <laughs> So couldn't uh, part of the top of the wall be like underneath where the sand is still and that could show the Canaanites? Um, yeah, or the, their heads or whatever we might need to be able to see who they are or the glyphs. That would be really great. Yeah, so um, if I go back, if you give me one second to go back to the ortho photo that takes a second to load. Um, the part on the right of the, Im of the image here once it loads, if it loads. <laughs> Even the compressed version is like 200 something megs, so it takes PowerPoint a second. Th this part right here to the right, where you see the white space, this is, this is ground. And you can see it's lower here, and then you, you actually have to climb up like a three foot thing to get to this south end of the wall. And it just goes like that. And probably in all that are some blocks. But I don't think we'll ever get the permit to dig that because they don't want to, they're afraid of something happening with the wall. Even if we were like, no, we'll do it like 10 feet away from the wall, I don't, I don't think they'll do that. But we might be able to get some Egyptian trained Egyptologists that have a better you know, relationship with the officials. Maybe they'd be able to do it one year. But I suspect they're, they're definitely there somewhere. Yeah, good question. And that would be really wonderful if we could get our hands on them. But probably unlikely at this point. Yeah, well, I guess you want the mic first. So in your um, travels, as you go, what is the, um, I guess, the amount of erosion or whatever? I mean, is it noticeable every time you go that there is definite damage? Uh, not, not necessarily on a yearly basis unless something somewhat catastrophic happened. There was an earthquake in 1899 that knocked over a bunch of columns and had to, like, reconstruct the columns. Um, you'd have to have something like that, but over a, a 10 or 20 year period, it would be, I think we could see some, and I'm really curious with the guy that I cited from the, about the 1920s, whether there actually was color on the wall in his day. Though the idea that it would be just the gold chalice and the only thing colored, I think he was having fun with it. But, so it would take time to see it in that sense, but that's something we also want to track, especially the, the whole project with the columns, you know, that's a decades long project that they are tracking. Our wall will be able to do, it's a little smaller, a little quicker. But it's something, if we're still working somewhere in Karnak, that we would go back and keep our eye on it. Um, you definitely track it as best you can. But year to year, unless something crazy happens, you wouldn't probably see it. A few years at a time, perhaps. Decades, definitely. Yeah, good question. Um, with the reference to the, or the possible reference to the Israelites on the, uh, on the wall, does that cause any problems with the, the Egyptian government and y'all studying it? Um, well, I mean, we, we don't say that these are the Israelites because we can't, within, there's no actual marker. I mean, it was a theory that Yurko had that, again, launched a, a whole lot of controversy in print. Um, but the Egyptian officials are aware of the possibility. But if, if they thought that, um, you know, I had some agenda or something about that, then yes. But, I mean, I don't. We're just trying to see what's on the wall. But they're, they're good about giving you the chance to do it. But you do want to be careful. And even just in terms of the scholarship, you don't want to make a claim that isn't really proven. And if you do word it, you want to make sure you use things like this is a possibility, right? They're not going to get offended at, at possibilities. So if they thought you were a Zionist or something, that could, they could definitely shut down the project. Uh, 
Uh, do you have an estimate of the amount of columns and or walls that have actually been recorded and studied? From Karnak? Yes. From Karnak. Um, most of them, most of the exterior walls for SETI's battle release have been published already. Um, Ramsey's is, we're catching up on that. The south wall still needs to be done there. The columns are constantly at work. The, the trick there is even harder because they're cylindrical. So how do you do that justice on flat paper? All right, so, but they've all been studied a lot, but the full publication hasn't happened yet. But there'll be like articles on them and different things as we go, like updates on the progress of the season and the last season and so on, which we'll be doing too. Um, but I, I couldn't really give it a percentage. I mean, it's gonna be another several years. The whole project will go for another decade or two, probably, as far as the whole Hypothal Hall project. But um, the exterior walls and the inside walls where they do a lot more rituals, again, those have been published for the most part. The columns are still, that's really their fo focus while I focus on this wall. Yeah. When y'all are working, um, are there like tourists that stand around and watch yep. you? Yep, that's part of the fun. I could have showed you all these pictures of tourists taking crazy weird poses and they'll wear wildly inappropriate things considering that they're in an Arab world context. There's also actually a lot of problems that tourists can cause or you'll hear them you know, their guide will say something, you're like, totally wrong, but I'm not going to bother with it. <laughs> or they'll be like, what are you doing up there, like, looking at you like you're nuts? And sometimes we climb up on the roof, and then they get jealous, which is fun. So, but yeah, there are tourists in and out. Um, actually, I would really love to see more tourists, despite all that, because the Egyptians need it. It's safe. It's safer than downtown Dallas. You're still more likely to die on the way to the airport than any other scenario in a trip to Egypt, or we wouldn't go at all. You just hear about the occasional huge, you know, event, but by and large, it is completely safe. They they don't, you know, try to attack people at night. Their cities are safer because they, their culture values that kind of thing. Now they'll harass you for tourism and for money, and they'll want to barter you to death, but they want to rip you off to your face <laughs> is the joke I use. But they are wonderful people. It's totally safe. I've never even remotely felt in any danger there. Well, maybe on the roads occasionally, but otherwise. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that's always one that comes up. And I should also clarify, if you see it in the news, where I work is in Luxor, which is, like, if Cairo is Chicago, Luxor is Memphis. Right? They're pretty far away. And all the news you get comes out of the area around Cairo or the oases around there. There are places that are more dangerous, to be clear, but we're nowhere near that. Where we are is safe as could be. So we'll just pray that it continues. There's never been an incident, not, not in a long time, I should say. And they do have security guards everywhere. Anybody else? The computer has a question yeah. about the battery. <laughs> Did we unplug it accidentally? Hmm. I don't know. All right, no other question. We want to thank Dr. Champlin for being here today. Thank you.